Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercies. Thank you for these that are here tonight. I pray, Father, you'd speak to our hearts. I pray you'd show us truths out of your book that'll be good for us, that we'll say when we all get all done. I'm sure glad that I came to Bible study tonight because something that I got shown was very near and dear to my heart, something that I already knew but made real to me in a special way. And I ask you to do that in Jesus' name and for his own sake. Amen. Turn to Isaiah chapter 52. It's a marvelous, marvelous thing. And a little bit rare to have a genuine servant's heart. But I want, you to sh I want to show you for about two minutes tonight what God thinks about a servant. Isaiah chapter 52, look at verse 13. God says, now here, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one being spoken of. God is speaking, and he's speaking prophetically about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52, 13. <laughs> Isaiah 52. Now read verse 13. Now don't let this get by you. Behold, <coughs> my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Well, that has to do, of course, with the Lord Jesus Christ coming here spending his perfect 33 and a half years of life, allowing himself to be put up on that tree and killed, and then God exalting him and extolling him. I want you to see that to know what God thinks about a servant heart. Because I was thinking of the last, you know, three or four days, When we, when we decided to have this picnic, which was just a tremendous delight to me, I won't name names because it doesn't make any difference. Some of the people organized this thing. Some of the people brought the food. Some of the people put the whole thing together. Some of the people stayed in the kitchen while everybody else sat down comfortably and made sure that everything was okay. Some of the people said goodbye, thanks for coming and have a nice afternoon and then stayed behind and put all the stuff back together and cleaned up. And sometimes, sometimes, you wonder, because Peter asked the Lord the question, what's in it for us? And, and that's another story and another lesson altogether. But sometimes I think those who are truly servants don't get the recognition that they deserve. But watch, find Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Look at verse 21. This has to do with the servants. 21. His Lord said unto him, that is the servant. Well, go back to 19 and, and get it. 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, there's the second coming of Christ, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, but watch. 
I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I think about the three guys that studied and worked and prepared and got messages ready which were a blessing to my heart. And they just did it out of the delight of serving the Lord. And so those who seem to be unsung heroes today, God's got a complete record book of all of the deeds. And there will be rulership granted to faithful servants. You remember last week when we met, we talked about the fence, that enclosure that was out there in the midst of those four camps of Israel. It was about the size of an average house lot. It was 75 by 150. And inside of it, there was just one structure. There was, it was a tent. And inside of that tent, there were a number of pieces of furniture. Well, we want to take up the looking at those pieces of furniture in their typical pictorial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Each and every one of them is. So if, when you went through that gate, remember the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm the door by me. If any man enter in, he'll be saved. Go in and out and find pasture. Well, if you went into that gate, the first thing you'd see is it was called the brazen altar. Brazen altar altar. And the thing had to be encountered when you walked in there, see, because in the matter of salvation, it's just, it's not enough to come near, it's not enough to come very near the door, it has to be, it has to be entered. Let me show you something. Get your hymnal and turn to page uh, 251. 251. 251. This is an invitation song. 251. And then find Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts 26. Did you find 251 in your, in your hymnal? All right, it says, Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on thee I'll call. Almost persuaded. Come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so near. O oh, wanderer, come. Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that bitter wail. Almost, but lost. Did you find Acts chapter 26? Acts chapter 26. Paul is defending himself and testifying to Festus, who is, or pardon me, a, 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 a Festus, who is the ruler. He said, verse, 20, verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? 
I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost is lost. Almost is lost. So when you come through the doorway there of, in, to go inside of that enclosure, you can't just look at that brazen altar that's there. It's got to be entered and inside when you look at that thing. It's the biggest of those seven pieces of furniture in size, indicating its importance. The thing is absolutely right there. Now find Exodus chapter 27, and let's begin this in earnest. Exodus chapter 27. Genesis, Exodus 27. Exodus 27. Exodus 27, verse 1, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. So you see it's square. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass, and thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, <coughs> and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar, and thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass, and the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Now that altar was the place of sacrifice, for the sins of the people. It's five cubits square, seven and a half feet square, and as you well know, five in the Bible is the number of death. Right over there next to Washington, D.C., not too far away from it, there is a big building called the Pentagon where they study war and they study death. How many sides are there to that building? Five. May Day is the 5th of May. May is the 5th month of the calendar. And it's the day that Russia shows off all of her military might in order that she, that she can display her killing apparatus. You know, if you're in the, back in the days when they were just flying around in the little single and double seaters and still in the small airplanes... If the plane is about to go down, do you know what the pilot puts into his microphone? Mayday, mayday, mayday. That's the distress signal. Five by five, it's the number of death. Out in the ocean, when, the, when somebody was lost, or in the woods somewhere, and they got the little generator, they can crank out SOS, SOS, SOS. That is the distress call. It's the call for help, and it's broadcast on 500 kilocycles. If there is a ship in the water and it starts the radio for help, they always say that it's breakdown number five. Breakdown number five, it's a ship in the water in distress. And this brazen altar is five. When you go through the Bible and you just see reference to things of five, know that it has to do with... Do you know that the very first man to die died in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5? Abel doesn't count. He didn't die. He was murdered. He was murdered. And in Genesis chapter 5, verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and he died. 
Do you remember, you probably remember when you read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, verse 5, do you remember what happened? Do you remember that guy, Ananias? He told the apostles, oh, I sold my piece of property for, for $27,500, and I didn't keep any of it. I just brought you the whole thing. And Peter said, why in the world are you lying? In Acts chapter 5, verse 5, and he fell down dead because he was lying. The five is the number of death. And then when you come to verse 10, you'll find out 10 is two times five. His missus walked in, and her name was Sapphira, remember? And she lied about it too, and he said, well, they're going to carry you out with her husband and bury you in the same place. In Romans chapter 5, it's the death chapter. It speaks about the death of Adam and Christ. How many fingers have you got on each one of your hands? You got five. Man kills with his hands. In the Bible, when people get assassinated, when they get stabbed, they always get stabbed, the Bible says, right in the fifth rib, right in the fifth rib. Five lords of the Philistines fought and killed the Jews. Joshua faced five Jews, he chased them, and he killed them. Killed them, killed them dead, killed them dead. You remember the Lord fed the multitude with five loaves, and then he told them, 30 minutes later that they were going to die of, of that natural food. Yeah, it's an awful thing. It's an awful thing. In Genesis chapter 15, when God made that unconditional covenant with Abraham, there were five animals that were killed, five animals killed. The Levitical offerings, which we, God willing, will speak of later on someday, there are five of them, and they speak of death. When you go through the Bible, you'll find out that the number five is an indication of, of death. And so, it's the picture. It's the, it stood just inside of the gate, and it's the picture of how fellowship with God begins, and it begins with blood. I want you to notice something. Can you find the book of Jeremiah? Yeah, you can. Find Jeremiah chapter 2. Now watch this. You'll like this. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. There's only one way to learn the Bible, and that's to study it. Jeremiah chapter 2, look at verse 20. God speaking. Of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, wholly a right seed. How then art thou turned into the generate plant of a strange vine unto me? Now look at verse 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary. That's a camel, by the way. Traversing her way. He said, but though thou wash thee with nitre. Nitre is, nitre is a, uh, uh, it's a washing soap. They mix it with oil and they still use it today to make certain kinds of, of soap. In other words, God is saying there is absolutely nothing that a man can do to cleanse himself of his sins. The only ground of fellowship with God that can be commenced is with blood. And so when you face God, when you're looking at that gate and open it up, and there's that brazen altar, that Mr. Five by Five, when you face God, you're turning your back to the world no salvation without that, and it's a picture of repentance. 
as we read there, it's made of shittim wood. Shittim wood is kind of like uh, it's kind of like cedar in the in the sense that it's very very wrought and insect uh, uh, repellent. It just it hardly ever ever rots, and the insects can't bite into it. It's a picture of the perfect humanity of the of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's overlaid with brass. And you remember we studied carefully what the brass symbolizes in the Bible. It is judgment. It's judgment. So it was a hollow framed brass plated altar. Seven and a half feet square, four and a half feet high, with a grating that held down. It was kind of like a big barbecue. The thing was square, and there was a grating about halfway down for the offerings for the offerings to be put on. It stood right at the entrance of the court, just inside the gate, and no Israelite could get absolution. That is, he couldn't get any ceremonial cleansing for his sins nor a blessing from the priest until he came to that very altar with a victim. He had to lay his hand on the head of that victim and claim its sacrificial death in his behalf. Unless he claimed that victim that was laid on the altar as his substitute, he could not be accepted. He could not be pronounced ceremonially clean. So you see that picture is the death, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you confess his death as your death, your substitute, you can't be forgiven. You can't have cleansing. And so you can see immediately then the importance of the brazen altar. Only by blood could access be had to the holy place. A sacrifice had to be killed to get the blood. And just as there is no possibility of approaching God and finding acceptance with him by any means, any method, any method except to come by the way of, cross, of, of Jesus Christ. Now I want to show you something that you know, but maybe you never just really wrapped your thoughts around it. Find John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 1. Now, I'm, I want you to get there because I want you to see this. John, chapter 1. Verse 11. John 1, 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, we're going to look at verse 13. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, class, this takes us right to the very central miracle of Christianity. The fundamental work of God the Holy Spirit is the miracle of the new birth in the individual soul. Now first see the negatives. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Okay, so now you see we recognize the mystery, but we have to insist upon this fact. Born of God. The theme here is the origin of life. Christianity is life. It's more than a creed. It's more than religion. It's more than a ceremony. It's more than cult. It is life that is realized in the individual soul. Life. Now watch this. Go to chapter 3. Chapter 3. Verse 
John chapter 3. You've read this a thousand times, but I want you to look at it now tonight. John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now kids, he's not being cute there. He's not being flip. He's not making a joke out of it. That's not mockery. This guy is dead serious. You're listening to the deepest, deepest agony of soul. There's a question there that suggests an utter impossibility. How do you start over? How can a man start absolutely all over with dragging along his past? Can you deny it? Can you forget it? Can you make it go away? Can you just undo it? How do I get rid of my past? Let's say you're a grown man or a grown woman, 40 or 50 years of age, and you know all of the things that you've done and all the places you've been and all of the things that you've said. What are you going to do with that? How can you get rid of your past? How do I escape from that haunting pressure of the things that are behind me in my life that I actually did, the places I actually went, the things I actually said, the thoughts that I had? How do I start fresh with no past? How can a man be born new? How can a man start over? How can he be born again? I mean, I'm 50 years old. What are you talking about? How in the world can I be born again? Can I shrink down, get back inside of my mama's womb and get born again? That wasn't a joke. That wasn't mockery. That wasn't being flipped. He was asking a question that that's absolutely filled him with, 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 with pain, with hope, with desire, and, but with hopelessness. <laughs> How can a man be born again? Start over. New birth certificate. No history. No doubts. No guilt. No debts. New identity. Absolutely, completely innocent. <laughs> Do you see the answer? You can die and leave all of that behind. Think about it. <laughs> How do you get rid of your past? Die. Die. Leave it all behind you. Your past can't get after you if you are dead. Leave all of that mess behind. Enter a brand new universe. Come out clean and innocent. Well, <laughs> just get born again. See? You don't have to fix up. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to do a bunch of stuff for God to be free, to, for God to forgive you. Just die. Get born again. Everything clean and fresh. Look at the possibilities. 
He can be born of God. Now the negatives, blood, will of the flesh, will of man. If you could stop and think about it and analyze it and get lots of people to consult and figure out the possibilities, those are the only three methods that any man could think of if he considers the possibility of a brand new beginning in his own life. But it's not of blood, which might be one of the ways that a guy could think of. Your blood ain't any good. Not of the will of the flesh. You can't learn yoga or deep breathing or transcendentalism or talk about nirvana or any of that stuff. Nor of the will of man. Life doesn't originate in human rationality. There is no evolution from within the material. There is no, listen to me, there is no decision of man that generates life. The gateway into salvation is a gateway of a brand new life which never, never can come through blood inheritance or through effort or through intellectual activity. Life never, never comes by the soul's own effort. The new birth can never be by any physical means. Not even water. Those that say you have to be baptized to be saved. No physical means can generate spiritual life. Look at John chapter 1, verse 13. John chapter 1, verse 13. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Got it? Now you see this clearly when you look at the brazen altar. The man brings himself with all of his baggage, all of his sins, all of his past, all that's dirty and unholy and ugly, every bit of it, he brings all of that stuff dragging along with him like a ball and chain anchored to his ankles and a sacrifice. And a sacrifice. <laughs> Do you see how you escape your past and the judgment and the penalty that's surely going to come from it? Well, you die. And don't go into oblivion or nothingness or dissolve. You get born again. A second birth. That's just how amazing is that? And it's a birth that connects you to God. It's a birth that makes you his child. So you see immediately that the one who was without Christ, he can't escape his past. He can't get rid of his sins. They're going to follow him all the way to the white throne judgment, and he's got no substitute to offer, and he will pay eternally in hell. Got it? Now look at John chapter 1, verse 29. John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Kids, there's the final substitute. There's the very one whose blood can finally and forever wash sins away. So John the Baptist tells us that the victim that God has provided is Jesus Christ. You can be gotten of God, you can become a child of God, you can be born that second time by God, 
through faith in his Son as the Lamb of sacrifice, no other way. He was the Lamb of God. Got it? Here comes this, here comes this Jew, this Israelite, up to the, right up to that altar. And he's got all of his sins and all of his crimes and all of his wrongs and all of that business. And he's dragging along. I mean he has to drag. He has to drag that bull, that lamb, that bullock, that ram, whatever it is. That guy can smell that, that animal can smell that blood. I mean the thing was a gory, awful mess. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animal sacrifice there. The thing must have been encrusted with blood and it must have been covered with flies and it must have stunk and it must have been a horrible thing. And here comes this Jew going to confess all of those sins and he's dragging this thing along and it don't want to come. It's bawling and it's, and it's scuffing its heels, hooves on the ground. <clears throat> it don't want to die. But the guy comes up and he confesses his sins to the priest, putting his hand right on the head of that thing, transferring, if you will, all of his sins to this substitute that God said to do, so it was okay. They cut its throat and throwed it up there on the barbecue grate, that altar, five by five, and it got burned up. And God accepted that substitute death unwilling as it was. And that guy got forgiveness. I see how you come to God. You come with everything that you got that's rotten. And, and the bigger, bigger, more suitcases you got of grief it is, the better you'll feel when it's all getting taken care of and you bring a sacrifice. Only he ain't unwilling. He came to die. He came to shed his blood for you. He came to fix things up. He came to give you forgiveness. And he, let it, he said, no man taketh my life, I lay my life down for my sheep. He was a willing sacrifice. Better than that, he was a perfect sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God. He still is. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. You getting that? Do you see how you get forgiveness and, and everything's okay between you and God? You bring the sacrifice that he said you need to bring. Did you find Revelation chapter 5? I didn't yet. I'm still looking. The papers are dry. My hands are so dry. I need to put more lotion on my hands. They're just dry. Revelation chapter 5. I saw in the first. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within it and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Remember, this scene is in heaven. Six. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, capital L, as it had been slain. Evidence, the marks of his crucifixion, of his death having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Then he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now you see, a lamb that had been slain, but is now alive, is a risen lamb. This lamb is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself in resurrection. Dead, it had been slain, but alive. He took the book and he opened it up and he could read it. 
the divine sacrifice that is risen and accepted of God, that brazen altar stood right before the door of the tabernacle, and the cross of Jesus Christ stands right before the door of heaven. Only with the blood of the sacrifice on that brazen altar could entrance be had into the tabernacle. And only by the way of the cross as an altar of sacrifice can anyone enter into the upper and the holy tabernacle into heaven itself. You see, you can't get to heaven without and apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see what an absolute travesty it would have been for the Israelite to bring a lamb to the brazen altar? And he said to the priest, now just look at my lamb. See how good looking that thing is? Man, it ain't got a blemish. It don't have a scar. It had never been sick. It's absolutely perfect. I raised this thing from the time it was, it, it was a bummer lamb. Do you know what a bummer lamb is? It's a lamb that doesn't have a mama, and you've got to take it out in the field. And, and when uh, lambing season, you got to go out and spend, you got to, if you ever done that, it's a marvelous, well, it's crummy, but it's marvelous in its own sense. You go out, you, out across the field where the, where the sheep are, it's lambing season, <coughs> April, end of April, 1st of May, and you've got to spend the night out there because sometimes you've got to help that, you've got to help the you with, with that lamb. And lots of times here and there, it, amongst all of the melee and the back and forth, there's a, there's a lamb that can't find, a, can't find a mama or a mama that's turned away or some such thing. That we call them bummers. So you get those quart beer bottles and you put a nipple on it and you fill the thing with milk and you, and you, feed, that, and you feed that lamb out of that. It's not necessarily a beer bottle. I just said that to it, there wasn't no time to drink beer. It's probably a root, probably root beer. Anyway, and you feed, and you feed those, you feed. So anyway, the guy says, the guy says, look at my lamb. I raised it from the time it was brand new born. <clears throat> it's a perfect thing. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that thing. Look at it. And then he tries to pass on without offering that victim as a sacrifice on the altar. The priest would have just driven him back. He would have told him, listen, that brazen altar is the place not for a living, but for a slain victim. And that he was making a mockery of the altar. That brazen altar was a place for killing. It's a place for dying. And just so, any effort that's ever made to set aside the necessity of the cross as an altar for a penal sacrifice to try to approach God and tell him how marvelous the Lord Jesus was, what a wonderful life he did, what marvelous teachings he did, the miracles he performed, and the people that he took care of, and the little boy's lunch, all of that stuff, that just mocks his cross and might well bring down the judgment of God. That altar was the killing place, and the cross was the killing place. It had two staves. It was square. And there's a ring here and a ring here and a ring here and a ring here. And those staves went through there just like this so that they could pick it. Go back to Exodus 27. Let me show you. Exodus 27. Genesis, Exodus 27. Let me show you. You'll get this immediately. I know you will. Exodus 27. Got it? Exodus 27, verse 7. Six, six. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shit and wood, and overlay them with brass. <coughs> and the stave shall be put into the rings, <coughs> and the stave shall be upon the two sides of the altar to, to bear it. So the staves, you see, were slid in through those rings to carry the altar. They represent the gospel by which the cross is carried around this wide world. Two staves to the altar. Two parts to the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ died and he was buried. He rose from the dead. 
and each one of those staves was necessary for the brazen altar. One of them would not have carried the thing at all. If you tried to carry it with one stave, you'd have just overturned the thing and wrecked it. So to say only that Jesus Christ died is not sufficient. If he didn't rise from the dead, then his death was no more important than the death of any man that failed and felt himself abandoned of God. Listen, if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, he'd just another dead man. But if you speak only of his resurrection, what difference does it make that he rose from the dead? If he did not die for our sins, listen to me, then we are still under the judgment of God. Got it? If he didn't die for your sins, then you're still under the judgment of God. There was a stave on each side of the brazen altar to carry it around, and both sides of the gospel has to be preached as it is proclaimed around the world, a death and resurrection gospel. That's the gospel of salvation for everyone that believes, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. That's how come we get to heaven scot-free. Oh, your sins weren't covered up and shoveled under the carpet. God didn't ignore them. God didn't say, oh, don't worry about it. God paid your price. God paid your price. It's too big for you to pay. Eternity in hell won't get the job done. Listen to me. <laughs> you know why he sent his son to die and to pay for your sins so you can go to heaven? It's because he loves you. He loves you. He said to Jeremiah, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. I could look in the mirror and say, I don't know how in God's name he could love me. But he does. I don't love him back very good, very much, very often, as I ought but I know he loves me. I know he sent his son to that killing place as my substitute. And I go free because of what he did for me. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his cross. That was an awful place. It was a place of murder, a place of blood, a place of blackness and darkness, a place where the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ah, but he was forsaken so that we could be received. Thank you for these that came tonight. I pray that you would indelibly impress on our hearts what you've done for us. And we're the beneficiary of your grace. And help us, I pray, to determine to serve you with more energy, more fervency. Father, now I pray you'd keep the harshmen safe in their travels. I pray, Father, you'd minister to Bonnie's heart. Give her that peace that passes all understanding, which you alone can give. I pray you'll show the doctors what to do and how to do it to give her relief according to your own will. Father, I pray that you'd bring us back Sunday anxious to hear from you, anxious after we leave the place to speak for you and watch you work in others' lives, because we've surrendered ourselves to you as servants. I ask you to send us home safely now in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. You have just been listening to Pastor Ken Bates of Mesa Bible Church of Pueblo. We hope that this message was a blessing to you. If it was, please let us know. Send us a letter to 702 South Main Street, Pueblo, Colorado, 81004. As always, keep us in prayer and continue to watch our weekly broadcast. Thank you and God bless.